Well, it was the 80s, and uh, the VHS beta debate had been pretty much ended at that point, for those of you who remember the two types of tapes that you could get, uh, and VHS had won. And my family wasn't well off enough to have our own VCR yet, but the corner uh, video rental store in town rented them uh, for, I believe it was a dollar a night could rent a VHS tape player, and then for another 50 cents you could rent a tape. And so generally, uh, when my parents got paid on Friday, they would often rent the tape player uh, for into Friday into Saturday, and uh, they would rent me a tape. And I remember, as I learned to read, one of the first things that I read was on this VHS tape, Be Kind, Please Rewind. Many of you probably remember that statement, and today there's not much use for it. Uh, you don't rewind a DVD or a CD. Uh, but I thought to myself, why is it that I would be kind enough to rewind this for the next person? I mean, I paid for it. I watched it. Why do I want to spend the extra minute or two waiting for this thing to go backwards in the, in the thing? And then it happened. One weekend, I got my own tape back. That I hadn't rewound. And do you know I had to wait two minutes for the thing to rewind before I could watch my tape? And I realized how much more kind it would have been to have rewound it for myself had I known that I was going to get it next. Well, that's maybe a sad example of a thought about kindness, but this time of year we see all kinds of examples of kindness. We see the red kettles and the people ringing the bells running around. We see people volunteer at soup kitchens. Ten years ago we had a huge winter storm on Christmas Eve into Christmas Day. I don't know how many of you remember that, but up in Cleveland it was like a foot of snow and I was working this crazy shift 3 a.m. to noon or whatever and on Christmas Day and it was the highway patrol was kind enough to escort me the entire way to work uh, to make sure I didn't come off the road. I'm sure he was waiting to pull me over and ask me why in the world I was on the road at 3 a.m. on Christmas morning, uh, but I was headed to work. Then Dee and I, I, I got off of work about 10. I got off early, and I went, had Christmas with my, with my family, and we were picked up Dee. We had just been married. We were going to our next destination, and the plow driver had just left a little bit of snow out in this lane, and it sucked me right down into the berm on the highway. Uh, and I was on Christmas stuck on the side of the road uh, with pretty much no way to get out on my own. Uh, now, wouldn't you know, not more than five minutes after we're sitting there, this car pulls up behind us and puts its blinkers on. And three people get out, and they said, Ah, oh, we see you're stuck. We were driving around in the snow today trying to help people out. Would you mind if we help push you out of here? Sure, I'll take a push. So they didn't end up getting me out. I was stuck too good. But I thought, what an act of kindness. These, this family was actually spending their Christmas driving around, pulling people out or pushing people out of you know, the snow. But they were stuck. I remember people stuck all over the place. Um, but they had spent their Christmas doing it. I thought, what a good act of kindness. Now, obviously, they were Christians, and they wanted to tell you their story, um, and that was fine. But what kindness. Now, we also talk this time of year not only about being kind to people, but being good and goodness. And Santa Claus is a tool for making your kids be good, I think. Um, and in our house, we tell them, if you don't behave, Santa will leave dog poop in your stocking. 
Now, most people get coal left in their stocking, um, but I, I never was told as a kid, but my wife was, that Santa Claus would leave dog poop in your stocking, which I think is a much more effective deterrent than coal as far as Santa will leave poop in your stocking, and we say, and we'll make you get it out with your bare hands. Uh, and so it encourages kids to be good. Uh, and so we have these themes of kindness and goodness. And I think we need a little more kindness and a little more goodness in the world today. I mean, the world is a cruel place. We have shootings. There was just one, I think, Friday. Um, there's all kinds of greed run amok. There's corruption. There's violence everywhere. And a little kindness, a little goodness, I think, goes a long way. I, I was searching for examples of kindness and goodness in the news, and I thought about it after the fact. Why would I search in the news for examples of kindness and goodness? They wouldn't have that type of thing. Um, but our world is self-centered. I mean, chivalry is dying. For you to hold the door for a woman, I mean, they kind of look at you like, what are you doing that? Uh, the mean seem to get ahead in our world. And today, I want to read to you a story uh, about David and David's kindness and David's goodness. Um, the introduction here is that Saul is dead. We talked about Saul last week. And he is gone. He's no more. He is dead. Pretty much his whole family is dead, too. He had tried to kill David, tried to take David out. But ultimately, God's will prevails, and David is the new king. And so we're going to start in, uh, we're actually going to finish in 2 Samuel as well. But we're going to start in 2 Samuel chapter 9. And some of you maybe know this story. Those of you who don't, please excuse my lips, and you'll understand as we get in why. Uh, it says, Then David said, Is there yet anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. And they called him to David. And the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. The king said, Is there not yet any one of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan who is crippled in both feet. So the king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, Behold, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, in Lodibar. Well, if I was Ziba, the servant here, I would think, Is this some kind of a trick? that the king wants to find out, the guy that tried to kill him, he wants to find out, is there anybody left in his family? That I want to show kindness to that guy. I, I just want to find somebody that I can show kindness to. And he wants to show kindness because of Jonathan. Now, if you remember David and Jonathan, they were best buds. And Jonathan was Saul's son. Jonathan should have been the next king uh, in Israel. But because of what we learned last week, Saul doesn't get to leave his lineage behind, and Jonathan passes away as well. Uh, the servant, I, I can't imagine what Ziba is thinking here. Imagine our leaders today. I have to say, if a congressman came up to me, I don't care if it was Republican or Democrat, and especially if the president came up to me and said, hey, I'm looking for so-and-so because I just want to be real nice to him today. No. There is no way I would believe that out of any of our political leaders' mouths. Uh, there has to be some other motivation there. I will tell you, when I was working for the government, if I called you and said I was looking for somebody, it was generally not because I wanted to be nice to them. As a matter of fact, I can't think of one time I was looking for somebody to give them a refund. Okay? Um, but would our leaders be this genuine today to say, listen, there's this person from the other side, and I just want to be kind to them. Can you, can you tell me where I can find them? And so we go on in verse 5, and it says, Then King David sent and brought him from the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and prostrated himself. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he said, Here is your servant. David said to him, Do not fear, for I will surely show kindness to you for the sake of your father Jonathan and will restore to you all the land of your grandfather Saul, and you shall eat at my table regularly. Again he prostrated himself and said, What is your servant that you should regard a dead dog like me? Now, you know, when I say Mephibosheth, some of you guys are going to say, Bless you. Uh, that's an unfortunate name, I think. 
uh, for us because it's hard to say. Um, and I have a plant. This plant, when we came in this morning, was above the baptistry. And I think that looks kind of like Mephibosheth might have looked. It was, it was lame and probably not all that well taken care of. This is about the saddest poinsettia I've seen in a long time. Um, and Mephibosheth would have been a pretty sad as well. Um, what do you think Mephibosheth was thinking when he was called to see David? I can't imagine. Your father's line has been wiped out. You are fighting against the current king, and he summons you to the palace and says, I want to talk to you. What about the guy that was taking care of him? I mean, there was this guy that was taking care of him. You're, he might have thought, oh, man, I'm kind of harboring an em enemy here, an enemy of the king. And now he knows where he is. He knows he's in my house and that I was taking care of him. Not a good situation, I wouldn't think. But he comes in, and he comes to David's palace, and he says, oh, Mephibosheth, like a friend. And he says, I, I want you to eat at my table from now on. Now, I don't know how many of you eat at the dinner table. Uh, we, we generally do. We eat at the dinner table and not in front of the TV. I know that was big for a while. But for you to get invited to my house and come and have a seat at the table, that's a big deal. Uh, because, number one, there's money involved in me paying for the food. Number two, I have to clean up my house. And number three, I actually have to treat you nice because you're at my, you're at my table and you're my guest. Uh, but this was an even bigger deal back in David's day. To be able to eat at the king's table, that was reserved for family and like other kings and princes and stuff. Like That was a huge deal to be able to be invited to the king's table. Not only that, but he says, I'm going to give you back all the land that Saul had. Now Saul was the king of Israel. I don't know how much land that is, but I imagine it's not like a couple acres out in the back country. It's probably some prime real estate. He says, I'm going to give you all that back. And the importance of land in that culture is that was how you provided for yourself. I mean, there wasn't a whole lot of, you know, blue-collar jobs, I guess you would call them, where you could run around and find factory work or anything. There wasn't a lot of that. You farmed. Now, the thing is, Mephibosheth, his feet are lame. How's he going to work the field? How's he going to do this? How's, how's he going to pull this off? But he, still, he's been given this privilege. You can eat here. You can you have all your lamp. You can have everything. What kindness to be shown to somebody. He ends with this question, why would you take care of me? I mean, I'm, I'm a dead dog. What, what good am I? Is he wrong? Is he wrong in this question? Why, why should the king take care of him. I mean, he's, he's, his father was an enemy of David. What would we do with the lame today? Somebody that genuinely couldn't help themselves, what would we do with them? We came across them on the street. Cost them a dollar, five bucks, 20 if you're feeling real generous. But to take them into your house, feed them, clothe them, that's some real kindness. What type of kindness do we bring at Christmas? Is it anything like this? We finish the story, starting in chapter 9. It says, Then the king called Saul's servant Ziba and said to him, All that belong to Saul and to all his house I have given to your master's grandson. You and your sons and your servants shall cultivate the land for him, and you shall bring in the produce so that your master's grandson may have food. Nevertheless, Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall eat at my table regularly. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, According to all that my, my lord the king commands his servant, uh, so your servant will do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table as one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. Uh, and all who lived in the house of of Ziba were servants to Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he ate at the king's table regularly. And it finishes saying, now he was lame in both feet. Now that's kind of like a fairy tale ending. I don't know how many of you get the majesty of watching 
fairy tale endings. I know that I get it quite frequently. Uh, we watch a lot of Disney in our household, so I saw a little bit of Little Mermaid last night, uh, Toy Story. But think of what Mephibosheth has been given. Food, shelter, provision for the future, and servants. I mean, he's given basically 35 servants uh, for him to manage. And he's even able to have a child. He has a son to carry on his legacy. I thought about in our modern culture, would we accept that kind of help? I know down here a lot of people probably wouldn't. If they were really down in their luck, uh, even really stuck, I don't know if they would accept the kind of help that David is offering here. But he was given responsibility with it. He said, you've got to take care of this land. You've got to manage your servants. You've got to take care of the things that are being given with you. And you're expected to be at my table regularly. You're expected to be here. I think that's an important picture for the future of the church. The king is coming again. And we're like Mephibosheth. Our names might not be as hard to say, but we're pretty lame. And I, I mean lame crippled. We are pretty handicapped. We were without a future. We were hopeless. We were shamed. We were scorned. And we were hiding from the king. But Christ came, and he showed us goodness. We can't stand in his presence, probably like Mephibosheth couldn't stand in David's presence with his crippled feet. But still, Christ lifts us up, just as David lifted Mephibosheth up. He shows his kindness to us. He alone is good and does good. We ought to recognize that. And he commands us, now you go and you do good like I've done good for you. He commands us to be kind. He says, reflect the kindness that you have been shown. So this season, we ought to show kindness to those who we're able to show kindness to. It's a time for repairing relationships. And I think a lot of times this time of year, we get stuck on the relationships that are broken. And we think about, oh, I'm not giving that person a gift, or I'm not sending a card to that person because they didn't send me a card last year, so no need. This is a time for doing good. This is a time to go against the grain of this world and show them exactly what we were given through Christ. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you this morning for the kindness which you've shown us. We pray that as we go from here, we would take a piece of that kindness and just reflect it to other people. I pray that uh, as we go from here, we would do good to others, as your Son has done good to us. In Jesus' name, amen. This season is kind of a season for sweet things. I know we make uh, cookies and we have candy canes. I will tell you, candy canes do not last long in our household at all. Um, we hang them on the tree and pretty much the next day it seems like they're gone. Um, cookies are kind of the same way. Um, they're fleeting. I mean, they just disappear. Uh, and after the wrapping paper and the Christmas meals are all gone, you know, all we have left is hope for next year. I think that's all the kids have anyway. What do I hear the day after Christmas? Next year for Christmas, I'm going to put on my list. And it's like, really? I mean, we just had Christmas. I heard this from Ivy yesterday in the store. For my next birthday, I'm going to ask for And I'm like, you just, it's just, December 2nd was your birthday. You just had a birthday. You know? Um, but all the things of this earth are fleeting. They really are. And the one thing that we can have that is everlasting is our hope in Christ. And it will never go away. And so if you've explored the things of this world and found them to be lacking, as I have, uh, but you haven't accepted Christ, you're welcome to do that this morning. Uh, if you've done that and you've been baptized and coming for a while, you're welcome to place your membership this morning. Uh, I'm going to sing a song, and you guys are going to sing it with me. I don't know if I did this solo last year. I know Larry's done it solo once or twice. You guys have heard it enough. You know it well enough. You're going to sing it with me today. It's uh, Mary, Did You Know? <laughs> 